All right. Good, good morning, everybody. Hi, this is uh, Eric Bolish. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Cutting Edge Information. I hope you're having a good day so far. I hope everyone is safe and, and is healthy. Before we really get going, and as we give some other folks time to uh, log into the webinar, I'm just going to cover some housekeeping points here on the screen. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure you can see and hear everything clearly. So I will call your attention to the, the questions pane on your screen, the Q&A pane, and you can use that to interact with us. No one but us can see the things that you type in there. So if you're having any trouble, please let us know. We can help you out. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please use that space. We may not be able to, to directly respond to every single comment, but no matter what, uh, we'll follow up with you. Uh, so whether it's during the webinar or after the webinar, uh, we will get in touch with you or at least respond to your comment or your question. Uh, other points, let's see. You'll get a recording of the whole webinar. So everyone always wants to know that. You will get an email with a link to things. Uh, so you'll be able to go back and revisit any of these points, uh, share it, so on. Uh, when we are done, we ask that you would please take a second to fill out a, a short evaluation that will pop up right on your screen. And we, uh, we really do value what you have to say. Uh, so, so every point of feedback, uh, every little comment, uh, we, uh, we really pay attention to there and try to incorporate it into our own continuous improvement uh, as far as these webinars go. Okay. All right. Let's, let's get into it here. All right. Today, uh, we're focused on deployment. Uh, as I like to say, it's one thing to get FMV rates, uh, and it's yet another thing to actually set those rates. So in other words, once you have access to FMV data, what do you do with it? What kind of process do you go through? Uh, and th this particular thing, implementation, deployment, rollout, whatever you want to call it, it's been a real focus of our team here for the last 18 months or so, uh, as we've made a concerted effort to help clients implement the rates that we develop and put into their hands. So, so today we're going to cover uh, several of the more important things that we've observed about rate deployment. Uh, the voices you'll be hearing today, uh, as per usual, for those of you who are repeat attendees, they, they belong to me, Eric, uh, and to Jacob Presson as well. We've both been here at Cutting Edge for, for several years, and we've watched our FMV methodology come into being uh, and evolve. And the work that Jacob and I do, uh, the team that we work with, we bridge the gap between the efforts of our internal data scientists uh, on the one side and on the other side, the work of clients uh, like all of you as you set and deploy those FMV rates. So I'm going to get into some of the areas that we'll be covering today. Quickly, we're, we'll level set everyone around our methodology so everyone's on the same page uh, and you know where we're coming from. Uh, then we'll get into the meat of things. We'll start with some basic principles, the principles that are at play in an FMV compensation system, and, and they can look very different, uh, but there are a few core things that, that everyone tends to wrestle with at some point. Then we'll move into activities and other elements that affect hourly FMV rates, uh, and that may change the overall compensation that you're paying to uh, HCP and non-HCP partners. Uh, we'll get into rate card design next, uh, and that's really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, what we're asking there are, what are some, some different things that companies do to get a usable rate card uh, or to implement rates in a way that balances detail with uh, accessibility and simplicity? Uh, and we'll look beyond the hourly rates to other com components of the engagement fee, such as travel, meals, uh, components like that. And then finally, before we get into questions, we'll consider the, uh, the impact of the current pandemic, uh, especially uh, relative to the current FMV ecosystem. All right, so to get everyone on the same page, let's dig into where our FMV methodology, or where the FMV data itself comes from, what our methodology looks like. Many of you know exactly who we are, but we've been around since 2002. For the last several years, we've been solely focused on issues of fair market value compensation. 
Uh, and that goes for markets around the globe. We're up to more than 130 of them, I think, at, at the present count. We gather data for our FMV rates via an annual data collection initiative. Uh, that involves surveys. It involves the collection of actual rate cards, uh, which we then analyze uh, and take apart for their different components. Uh, and at this point, what this means is that we've collected hundreds of thousands of data points. And those data points, each one of them is an hourly FMV rate paid to a particular type of specialist in a particular market. And we put our data annually through a model that incorporates a host of other factors as well, market factors, economic indicators, to produce hourly FMV rates. And that's our product. Hourly FMV rates for more than 160 different physician specialists, allied health professionals, non-HCPs, market access professionals, patients, and, and so on. The topics that we'll discuss today are directly connected to this whole process that I've described uh, because we tend to encounter all of the challenges that come along with deployment as we're helping clients with their FMV rates. Uh, and those challenges may come at the individual market level or at the global level, or really uh, at, at somewhere in between or at some point in between. All right, so let's get into things here. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand things off to Jacob. Uh, we're going to start here with basic principles, and, and he's going to walk us through the same initial steps and questions that we tend to navigate with clients as they go about deploying their FMV rates. So here you go, Jacob. Take it away. Thanks so much, Eric, and uh, and I'll echo his thanks for everyone who is attending today. Um, so during the last webinar that we did a month or two ago, we talked a lot about where the FMV data can come from and kind of just the basic deployment decisions. And like Eric mentioned, today we're going to dive a bit deeper into some of those deployment questions and hopefully offer some solutions to common issues. Now, one of the big issues that we run into, especially for companies trying to manage a deployment of our full database, is the constant tug of war between simplicity and granularity. Said another way, do you want to provide a clear, easy to use set of numbers, or do you want users to have access to extremely specific, precise data? And really, one of our biggest goals today is to help you find the best of both worlds, that middle ground, because you can absolutely develop a system that delivers highly specific data but that's easy to consume. And later in this session, we'll talk a lot about bucketing or clustering titles, which is a really big way that we see clients trying to find this middle ground. Now, another big consideration for FMV deployment is the format or medium of that rollout. Um, some companies may have full software solutions for global deployments either developed internally or with the help of third parties. Um, other companies that are maybe operating on a smaller scale, they might rely more on a distribution of PDFs or a table of rates that's contained in an SOP or other documentation. Um, just a note here, this is a general point. We've worked with small companies who have very sophisticated software systems, and we have large clients who prefer to get into the, get their hands dirty with the, uh, with closely managing each deployment on a country level. And so these are certainly not value statement. Uh, each company has its own needs and priorities. And along those lines, regardless of the scope of your deployment, teams need to work closely with their local groups on the ground in order to understand their needs and what should be included in the final rollout. We've talked about this on a couple of our previous webinars, but I do wanna make sure that we emphasize it, especially in this one. Local teams are going to be your experts on the ground, not just when it comes to the specific regulations or restrictions on HCP engagements, but a lot about what their needs may be. 
To dive uh, further into this topic, our, our graphics team captured an amazing scene of uh, Bill Murray from the classic film, What About Bob? To, to, to kind of help us uh, hopefully drive home the importance of involving local teams. And going back to the previous point I was making about the format of the deployment, what works for one country or one region may not work in others. Um, for example, we're, we're currently working with a client on a global deployment and we're, we're in, in the Latin America deployment and Argentina, as, as a lot of you might know, has extremely high currency volatility. Because of that uh, dynamic, it's going to require a different format than what some of the other countries in that region or even around the world might get. And it needs to be tailored to their needs because they're in a unique market. And that's just a small example of, of, of how you might want to bring in local teams uh, for their perspective. And in addition to unique economic circumstances, sometimes different business units are going to be focused on a different profile of HCP or really any third party. And it's important that their final deployment uh, reflects that. And last but certainly not least, I'll return to the point of local rules and regulations. This, uh, this pops up a lot with our clients and it can be really hard to keep up with. Sometimes this is an hour, a maximum hourly rate that's allowed like the Netherlands, or it can be a daily cap, which is the case in South Korea. You might also want to account for very for local variations in travel compensation guidelines. Um, while we're always there to help our clients based on our knowledge of the international landscape, local teams that you work with are going to be the true subject matter experts about what is happening on the ground. So with all that being said, how do you how do you actually do this? One of the easiest is to simply maintain contact with country level teams throughout the FMV cycle, not just during the deployment time frame. Um, for some companies, the quote unquote deployment process is, is effectively a permanent ongoing process. That's not a slight against what happens there. That just kind of reflects the complex nature of an FMV deployment and the required back and forth that can happen and, and, and sometimes you, you can't just treat a deployment process as being a box to check off. It's a continuous process, a continuous dialogue. Um, other examples include we have had some clients that have run pilot programs where they've kind of tested the waters of potential deployment processes with key uh, groups in each region. Um, additionally, you could set up kind of a select group of close partners around the world that are really your touchstones on a global scale, and they're the ones that maybe you bounce ideas off of. Um, and some of these ideas are more suited for uh, company or groups operating on a global scale, uh, but you could certainly use this even if you're just operating in a regional unit and are trying to maximize the effectiveness of how well your teams work together. Great, thanks, Jacob. Okay, all right, so, so we have a, a baseline picture painted there. We, we know some of these core issues uh, that clients try to address uh, in order for deployment to go well. Uh, but what about some different pieces of the compensation puzzle? And, and here we're looking at rates for specific types of HCP activities, things like prep time, travel time, uh, some specific roles. Um, an example might be advisory board chair there. So what happens in these cases? And here I'm going to introduce the first of two poll questions that we have today. Uh, and we'll see the, the poll pop up on the screen here in, in just a moment. Uh, but the, the question is, what type of rates does your company primarily use? And I'll give you a chance to read through those options, but it's a really a, a bifurcation between hourly rates where everything is calculated from the ground up, um, literally for each engagement, as well as flat fees, or flat fees will be the alternative where different activities get different specific amounts. And then of course you have a a gray area in the middle. So we're going to let different answers uh, come through there uh, and then take a look at where the responses land. Let's see, things seem to be to have quickly jumped in one direction. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Not surprisingly, uh, it's interesting to see this this kind of play out in front of us because you know when when we really started digging into the the details of FMV, uh, it, in my case personally, about five years ago, um, flat fees were really um, kind of uh, the, the preferred medium for communicating FMV, and and there's certainly good reason for that. You know, you you want to make sure that what you are putting in front of end users. Um, it, it is kind of it, it encapsulates the entire nature of the engagement. So if you're uh, engaging in HTTP for a speech, you want the end user to just kind of automatically understand this is the total fee for that engagement. Um, but really what we've seen increasingly is that hourly rates are a lot more common and that's reflected in these poll results here, uh, just on the money at, uh, at two thirds of respondents are indicating um, that, that that they prefer just publishing the hourly rate. And that certainly doesn't mean you give the hourly rate and you go totally hands off. There's still, like I was talking about earlier, you know, that, that continuous involvement. Um, but it does allow the teams on the ground to A, better understand what exactly they're working with, um, and, and B, have the flexibility to deal with some things that you might not adequately be able to predict. Um, now, th the fact that there are a lot of people who still use a combination of both does still reflect a little bit of that desire to me uh, to, to make sure that people understand, okay, we have a one hour speech that's going to be paired with, you know, maybe one or two hours of prep time, and then a clear understanding of how exactly travel fits into that and it can bundle all that together and give people a nice clear understanding of, of exactly how uh, of exactly how much an appropriate compensation would be. All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for for pitching in there. Um, and so. Before we get into the details of one of our uh, favored approaches to deployment, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the other issues that can come up. And uh, one of the ones that I was that I was talking about just now was the the issue of prep time, kind of how that can get uh, bundled in or incorporated into uh, flat fees sometimes, or for those of you who publish both hourly rates and flat fees, kind of depending on the activity. Um, so. As we've discussed previously, uh, preparation time is typically compensated at the same hourly rate as the activity itself. Uh, the exact number of hours compensated is probably going to vary by both activity and by company. Most of the time, for example, we see an hour long speaking engagement paired with maybe one to three hours of preparation time. Similarly, a half day or a full day advisory board might have two to four hours of prep time. Um, now, one of the many, many changing features of our COVID-19 world is the uh, rise of virtual platforms, especially for speaking engagements and also advisory boards. Uh, while some companies have had these in place for years, there is really new territory for others. And as a result, we have worked with several companies who are paying an additional preparation fee related to training on the virtual platform being used. Um, it is worth noting here that over the past few years, we have seen most companies apply a single hourly rate regardless of activity. And this has two positive side effects. A, uh, it ensures that uh, you have a good consistency of payment amounts across engagement types, specifically for HCPs who might be working with you in different roles. And B, it's going to simplify the deployment and rollout process, which is conveniently our task at hand here today. Uh, but I will say that, you know, the, the, the role of the advisory board chairperson is less easily adjusted to the same base hourly rate than some others. Historically, we used to see this paid at a higher hourly rate than a general advisory board participant. Uh, typically, this would be about maybe 10, 20% higher than the, um, than the participant's hourly rate. However, in many cases, this doesn't accurately reflect the advisory board chair's role. They're not necessarily more involved each hour than a given participant. 
Instead, their role might be better described as bringing a specific expertise or ability to shape conversation. In this case, a separate premium is probably more appropriate. Um, this is typically given in addition to prep time or other fees to the HC. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Jacob. Um, so, so we've touched on some key points in those first couple of sections. Uh, we've looked at some basic rate decisions. We've looked at specific activities and modifiers that might affect compensation. Now let's get right down into the weeds and talk about how hourly rates appear on rate cards. In, in this section, we'll look at who is involved in setting and publishing rates internally. And then we'll spend a fair amount of time on a big deployment topic, and Jacob talked about this earlier, which is the, the bucketing or grouping of rates, the clustering of different titles uh, into similar groups. Uh, and the issues we'll look at there uh, are how do companies combine rates for some HCPs while letting others stand on their own? How do they strike that balance of specificity and simplicity uh, that so many people are looking for, so many organizations are looking for in uh, developing a rate card and an FMV system. Thanks, Eric. So before we dive into kind of our preferred design approach that Eric mentioned, I do want to talk a little bit about who is historically involved in the process of developing a rate card or deployment system. We do see right now that a majority of the industry takes a pretty solid ownership of their rate cards, either entirely on their own or with the assistance of a third party. Um, a small minority do take an off the, off the shelf solution from third parties and then deploy those. Um, while it is possible to tailor those or tailor these to specific needs, given what we talked about earlier regarding the involvement of local teams, it sometimes can be difficult to make these systems meet your specific needs. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and now for, for kind of a, a, a really deep dive into bucketing. And, and I'm gonna start here by just giving you an example of what, uh, what a sample of data might look like from, uh, from an FMV provider. And so the table on the right here, you see the first column lists the different titles with whom you might be interacting. Then the second column shows the tier two rate for each of these individuals. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes, um, sometimes these rates are published in ranges. Sometimes it's not an hourly rate being published. Instead, it's a flat fee. But today we're going to focus on just a single hourly rate. And in this case, it's just a, a sample tier two hourly rate. And so really when, when you start thinking about bucketing, at its core, we're trying to cluster different groups of titles together to really simplify the uh, simplify the data that we're trying to share with people. And one of the easiest ways to do this is with what I call title categories or clusters. And so when I tackle something like this, um, I would look at what the what the client is hoping to deploy in each of their markets and start to break them down into different categories. And so the first thing that comes to my mind um, and that I've just highlighted in red here are each of the real specialized MDs here in this list. So that would be cardiologists, neurologists, all the way down through surgeons. Um, and then what I do is I just give an, I just make an average of the uh, of the rates in those columns and i put that in the tier two rate in the table on the left on next to specialist and then i kind of repeat this for different groupings of individuals and so uh general care to me might include internal medicine and OBGYN primary care these are all mds uh but they maybe fall into a more of a general care and again i'm just averaging those titles together and then putting that into the tier two rate next to general care. Same thing for healthcare associates. Uh, just a note here, the terminology isn't something that you have to stick to. Um, it's really just there to hopefully help end users understand exactly what is included in this bucket. Um, 
And then again, we'll repeat that process for uh, for the last group of what I would call third party executives. And so we're, again, we're just making an average there. So, so this is a way to kind of take just the titles that you have in your list, create a quick average. And this table on the left is going to be hopefully a bit easier for end users to quickly scan through and understand exactly what rate they need to pay. It's a simplified system um, and, and hopefully easier for those end users to, to work through. Um, when you're doing this kind of title clustering, there is kind of a radical variation that you could do here and that we have actually seen some clients uh, apply, which is you take all of the MDs, which I just highlighted in blue here, and you just create a single average of those individuals. And then you take all of the non-MDs, which I just highlighted in um, which I just highlighted in yellow, and you make an average of those. Now where this starts to uncover some of the potential challenges with bucketing is that you'll see our uh, our bucketed rate for MD at 237 is quite a bit lower than the recommended rate for oncology that you see in the table on the right, which is 270. Um, and so you might run into issues there in terms of competitiveness. On the flip side, you might run into issues with compliance if you look at our MD rate and compare it with primary care provider, which is 183. Now, Bucketing is, is almost never going to be a one size fits all. It's going to depend on kind of how your groups on the ground intend to use the data um, and also what, what their specific needs are. If they have a wide range of titles that they hope to engage with, this kind of title clustering may not be the best approach. So what you might do instead is just look at the different clusters of prices that you see um, in this chart. And so uh, I spend all day in numbers. And so I apologize if, if maybe I'm moving a little bit too fast here. Uh, but so I look at the, the chart on the right and I see, you know what, there's, there's a pretty good number of titles here that are over 220. And so I will call that group A that I just highlighted in yellow, and I will average those together, and that gives me my tier two rate for group A. And then I'll kind of repeat that process. It looks like there's another little bucket here um, from 180 to 220, and I'll create an average of those titles that I just highlighted in blue. And then last but certainly not least, you have group C. So this helps us a little bit because it means that all of the titles in a specific group, regardless of their qualification or background, they're going to be within a similar price band. And so that means that the bucketing outcome is going to be, uh, is going to be closer to the mark. Where it does kind of fall short a little bit is that um, the, uh, the group names aren't necessarily super intuitive for end users. And so you do have to balance that, you know, group A might be a more specific rate, uh, but you will then also have to provide a key to everybody using this to say, okay, cardiology belongs in group A, primary care provider belongs in group B, and so on. Um, and, and so that, that does limit the simplicity of it a little bit. But before I leave this section, um, I, I do want to present what is what is a bit of a middle ground here. And so let's let's talk about a hypothetical company who is focused on neurology and oncology. And let's say that they want specific rates for those two um, for those two titles. And so we'll bring in neurology at 230, oncology at 270. Um, and then after that, we'll bring in all the other MDs to um, uh, to our combined table. And the average of those titles is 232 here in our sample table. And then as we look at the rest of these titles, let's say within this single country group or, or within this local operating unit, their main focus outside of MDs is primarily going to be nurses and PhDs. So we bring those into the table for those individuals 
And then we can kind of hold off on the rest. And that's not to say that they aren't important, but this is part of why working with the local teams during deployment is so important because you might have this data for them, they just might not need it, you know, depending on the local healthcare environment. Um, it may not be as as necessary to engage with payers or hospital executives. And so that's just kind of almost unnecessary detail in that rate card. And so you don't have to include that and you can keep that until such a time as it does become necessary. <clears throat> Hey, before we jump into this, Jacob, I'm actually, I'm going to go back a little bit because as you were talking through everything, a number of different points occurred to me, especially as I think about some of the work that we are doing right now uh, and some of the work that we've done in the recent past as far as helping, helping companies arrive at this point of, th this balancing point between simplicity and specificity. And... Uh, Jacob showed a bunch of different bucketing approaches here, and these are all general approaches. Some of them are, are fairly literal uh, in terms of how you might roll them out. But I want to take a half step back or, or a full step back and, and talk about how how companies, our clients specifically, are, are, are thinking about this exercise. And we, we do have clients who just use every single title that they get access to. So we have an online portal. I know many of you in the audience today are familiar with that portal. It's called FMV Connect. And in FMV Connect, for any market, you can pull up any specialist in any currency. And there are, there are clients who prefer to use that essentially as their live rate card. So that, that's a, a real deep dive into specificity. Uh, and they may even be using uh, exchange rates that fluctuate, you know, that are, that are being adjusted on an ongoing basis, as opposed to just you know, putting a number down on a page uh, or a, a metaphorical page. Um, but on the other end, you have these, these bucketing approaches. And I want to shine a spotlight on the accessibility piece here that, that Jacob referenced, because when we work on major global rollouts, uh, simplicity is often a major concern. And in these cases, and I'm sure this is, this is true for many of you, uh, there's a core team who is, <clears throat> who is living and breathing rates uh, for, for multiple months or, or sometimes years, sometimes on an ongoing basis. But on the other end, the end users don't necessarily have all that background knowledge. So in these cases, we get into building some of these customized buckets um, that Jacob ha has shown you some examples of. And what I want to emphasize is that no two approaches are the same. So you know, we did one recently that had a couple of specialist groups uh, and then a general MD group and then I think three, two or three non-HCP groups. So you're talking maybe six buckets there. Uh, but another similar one, uh, we just did had, had five different buckets. So th they get arranged in different ways. And sometimes the buckets do highlight specific roles. And it may not even be within a, a specific therapeutic category like the, the slide that happens to be up on the, the screen right here. Uh, we did one that uh, highlighted surgeons, um, so it goes in a slightly dif different direction there. We've, we've highlighted NPs and PAs uh, outside of the physician buckets, but also above the non-HCP categories uh, because clients have, have really focused in those directions. We've even pulled out patients. Uh, we've pulled out payer executives as different subgroups that organizations may want to to be focused on. Um, and I'm going to jump back a little bit here too, Jacob. I don't want to screw things up too much for you, but um, where was the, the simplicity one? Okay. And, and you, you touched on this too, but <clears throat> I wanted to talk about how uh, differences like the one we see here on screen or, or how, uh, how buckets like the ones here may, may come into play or how we see them coming into play. Um, and you, you talked about this, how some markets only require a basic breakdown. So you, you may have small affiliates who really only need MDs and non-MDs or HCPs and non-HCPs or, or some sort of fairly simple break between two or three buckets. Um, but there are other cases here where, where this may come into play. I know we did one rollout where globally uh, the organization was rolling out rates 
for the first time uh, or, or dictating rates in a certain way for the first time. And it was going to be a major change for a lot of the affiliate markets. So in those particular affiliates, they wanted to keep it really simple uh, and introduce the concept of categorizing rates in this particular way. Now, and it's not to say that in their more sophisticated uh, or complex affiliates, they weren't rolling out a more sophisticated and complex rate card. They were. So in, in, in those particular markets, they, uh, if I remember correctly, they, they even had a, a number of specific specialists pulled out. So within the same organization, you can run the gamut uh, from really complicated in some markets uh, all the way down to fairly simple and straightforward in some other markets. Uh, I think those, those were the big points that jumped out at me. Uh, oh, 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 one final point. We're talking about tier two rates here. Uh, Jacob used it for the sake of example. Uh, we, we publish four tiers, and I know Jacob is going to get into tiering a little bit later, but one of the first steps that we do take with clients is to map our tiers onto theirs. So if you have two or three tiers, which happens, how do our, our four tiers align with them? Uh, and then digging into that a little bit more, at what rate percentile should we be using uh, or should we be setting rates to get good alignment with what your HCP partners are going to be expecting? Um, and we see on, on this tier point, we also see situations where smaller affiliates with fewer physician thought leaders might use fewer tiers than the larger global organization or than some of the more sophisticated markets. Um, so in some of those affiliates, you may just have two tiers where you have top level uh, thought leaders, uh, HCPs who may be involved in, in clinical development or may be uh, engaged in cross-border engagements. And then essentially you have an under tier that, that involves everyone else, um, but, but folks whom, with whom you, you may need to engage for some purpose at some point. So you want to make sure you have rates in place. Uh, I think those are all the, the specific points, Jacob, that I wanted to jump into. There, there's a lot of, a lot of customization that goes into this grouping and bucketing. And essentially what you have to do is, is dig into the way your organization thinks of partnering with HCPs, uh, and as, as Jacob emphasized, focusing on the specific types of uh, specialists uh, with whom you, you, you may be engaging. All right, Jacob, I, I've said a mouthful. I'm going, to, I'm going to move on to the poll here. Just need to get through these slides. Okay, all right. So here's the, uh, the the second and final of our two polls today. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're going to take a look at at bucketing, since that's what we just spent so much time talking about. So how do you feel about publishing rates using buckets? And we have a number of different options here, and we're just curious about how you and your organization approach this. And we'll let some of these some of these numbers roll in. So this will be interesting, Jacob, because there's a yeah, and uh, and for those of you who are indicating that you're not interested in bucketing rates, I, I'm curious uh, what drives that. And I mean, there's there's plenty of very good reasons why bucketing might not be a good fit. It's possible that it's just over complicated for the scale of your deployment. Um, it's it, it's also possible that uh, that you know your your compliance culture or your background is really puts a heavy emphasis on uh, on clear specificity in the rates. Uh, but if if you indicate that you don't know or you're not interested, uh, please feel free to just pop a note in the Q&A. Uh, we'd be really interested to hear your feedback on kind of why you feel that doesn't work for your organization. Um, but but it's good to see, you know, a lot of people are already using bucketed rates in some way, shape or form and that there is some interest in adopting them. And honestly, I think that third option, you know, you might be interested, depending on feedback, is uh, is 
is really in the spirit of, of what we've been talking about here today, which is that a lot of times when we try to make decisions in a vacuum, um, they, they can backfire quite badly if we're not careful, because a lot of our role is not just like handing down mandates. It's about listening to the people receiving those, those, the, that guidance and, uh, and hopefully facilitating the, the best way for them to follow any applicable rules and guidelines. Jacob, on that point, um, another reason, and I apologize if this is this came up already, um, but another reason that uh, in a particular market, you may pull out specific specialists that you used, I think, oncology and neurology in your example, uh, is in that market, those may be the HCPs that the affiliate operating unit is engaging with. And it may not be that the rate card that, that in all other markets or globally the entire organization is identifying those specific uh, HCPs. Um, but that, that would be a case where you are responding to feedback at the affiliate level. Uh, and you're saying, okay, here in this affiliate, you know, we are, we're primarily working with these oncologists. Uh, we know that's not how the, the rest of the organization's rate card goes, but we want to make sure um, that we're paying oncologists uh, at, a, at a competitive and compliant level. So that local piece comes into it and the feedback piece comes into it as well. Okay. All right, I think the last section here, oh, you know, we have a final piece here, Jacob, for you yeah, before just, moving uh, into our last section. Just one last note as we kind of wrap up the deployment focused section. Um, uh, I, I do want to kind of go over what are, what are some good questions to ask both yourself and uh, um, and uh, and the local teams on the ground as you go through a deployment process. So, does your company want to deploy rates for all engagement types or a specific? Um, um, oh, sorry, I apologize. Does your organization want to apply rates globally or for all parts of the business? Or is it acceptable to use, uh, uh, you know, a different approach for individual country uh, or individual regions? Um, the other question you might ask is, you know, do you want to deploy rates for all engagement types, maybe a select subset of engagement types, or just the base hourly rate for all engagements? Uh, you know, as mentioned earlier, we do see many clients these days operate off of the base hourly rate and. If, but you know, if you do uh, prefer to publish flat fees, which we saw from the poll, um, uh, th th there certainly are some who, who still go that route, then your rate card sh should certainly account for that. And finally, you know, does your company want to deploy a single set of rate caps or a range of acceptable rates? Uh, some of our clients, from a global perspective, do not want to get too involved in setting specific rates at the local level. So instead, they might use global FMV data to offer a suggested ceiling to local teams. Um, in other cases, a, a more hands-on approach uh, is, is involved. Great. Okay. Well, that brings us to one of our, our last sections. Uh, let's touch here on some other, other issues that might impact deployment. And here I'm talking about issues like tiering, which we've touched on a little bit, like travel. Uh, factors that really come into play when setting either the base hourly rate or arriving at a total engagement fee. And so kind of when you're considering tiering practices, and I know that this is something that, that we've talked about uh, a bit previously, the first step is, is making sure that you've set out objective criteria that can be consistently applied across all specialists. I know that tiering nurses and other non-specialists uh, can be a challenge and many clients as a result do have two or more parallel tiering systems in place. Uh, the important thing is to make sure that you're always comparing apples to apples here. Um, of course, ideally, you do want to update the HCP segmentation or tiering on a pretty regular basis. Uh, obviously, for tiering most of the time, an HCP will go up and not down, 
but it's still an important area to consider. Um, it, it's also important to have an exceptions process in place that your team knows to follow. Um, by its very nature, you probably won't need it too often, but for compliance purposes, you do want it laid out clearly beforehand. In, in some cases, this can be as simple as identifying which person in the organization is responsible for the final handoff or the final sign off of the exceptional rate. In other cases, it might require a specific set of criteria that an HCP must have in order to qualify for an exceptional review. Um, with regards to travel and meals, the current industry standard is to pay HCPs for travel or disruption time at 50% of the base hourly rate. Um, this can get implemented a number of different ways, but the underlying assumption is usually around the 50% mark. Of course, we know there isn't much travel happening right now, but of course, uh, we can all hope that the industry soon enough returns to normal. Meal allowances are going to be set relative to local standards. We, we say this because it, it's really difficult to enforce a specific currency amount uh, while international, uh, while engaging in international travel, just because of significant differences in purchasing power. Um, I, I will go ahead and remind folks, we have covered both of these topics in a previous webinar. So for those of you interested in learning more, you can find a recording of that webinar on our website. So overall, when we're tackling FMV, and this is a, a recurring theme in our webinars, um, it really goes beyond the deployment itself. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have an indiv independent evaluation of the rate structure, uh, a clear documentation and operating procedures. Uh, just, you've distributed and deployed rate guidance to all necessary parties. You've established a robust tiering system and you have a systemic approach to additional payments or fees like preparation time and travel compensation. Great, okay, Jacob, thank you, all right. Before we wrap things up and move into questions, we do want to touch on the pandemic and its effect on the fair market value landscape. Uh, Jacob has some thoughts and observations to share, and then I'm gonna jump back in to quickly talk about what we have been doing on this front. So Jacob, I, I know a lot of this is anecdotal, um, but it is important to share. Uh, I know you've been seeing uh, people respond to the current landscape in some different ways. So, mm -hmm. so what can you tell us on this front? Sure. So really two major themes have emerged right now. The first is that, and, and this is largely unsurprising, but it's worth saying, um, the, the impact of COVID on engagement levels is, is really largely related to the therapeutic area of the individuals with whom you are trying to engage. This means that if your strategic plan for the year involved working with respirologists or urgent care specialists, most of those events have either been uh, d delayed or canceled. Other companies have been able to switch to online events with relative ease if their target population was pretty uh, isolated from the COVID-19 crisis. The good news here is that even among companies that are have been pretty significantly affected, we do see a lot of optimism that uh, engagement levels in 2021 will rebound, uh, hopefully at least close to what we saw in 2019. And second, the nature of the crisis itself and in the abundant misinformation surrounding it has really driven home how important life science companies are in maintaining effective scientific communication throughout the industry and, and really a lot of lessons learned potentially on how we can all do better. All right, I'm going to I'm going to jump in here, Jacob, um, and talk about uh, something that's important to us, I know many of you in the audience have, have heard me talk about this already a couple of times, uh, but it's important and it's important to talk about. So we want to make everyone aware of complementary FMV rates that we're giving away. We are providing 2020 hourly rates for any HCP or non-HCP who might be relevant to our collective fight against the novel coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, I think everyone's trying to figure out how they can make even the smallest of contributions, and, and this is something we can do. And we've already given these rates away to a number of clients. Um, so 
and non-clients, frankly. So uh, you don't have to have purchased our rates. You don't have to have implemented our rates. But if you just want to check to see what hourly FMV looks like for some of these specialists, uh, we're happy to work with you. Uh, you can email us at that email address on screen. You can drop a note into the Q&A pane, follow up with us after. However, however you manage to get in touch with us, uh, we'd be happy to work with you on these titles. And it, another note, it doesn't just have to be these. If there's a, a specific uh, specialty that you want to focus on uh, that's related to, uh, to the current situation, then of course, um, of course we're going to help you out. And that is pretty much it. Before we get into the Q&A, um, I'm going to touch on a few quick points. Uh, first of all, Please remember the, uh, the post-webinar evaluation, which pops up on your screen, it's important to us. Uh, if you could take a minute to fill it out, it won't take long at all. Uh, and we will read through your scores and what you say. Um, we do have some events coming up later in the fall, including a webinar on tiering. We've actually been doing some research on that front. Uh, and so we'll have some original findings to share there, some new data. And we'll also be at a couple of the regular conferences that a lot of us go to. The, these are going virtual this year, of course, but let us know if you're going to be there. Let us know if you're interested in uh, discounted tickets uh, or fees for those conferences because we can often do something to help you out. Uh, and lastly, I will reiterate, do let us know if we can help you with the rates, uh, with any rates that can aid in the fight against the pandemic right now. And we're, we're more than happy to have that conversation with you. Okay, so a lot of questions have come up. I, I'm, I'm going to remind you too, if you have questions, comments, feedback, please use the Q&A pane. There has there have been a lot of different points coming through there. We're going to try to touch on as many as we can. A lot of them combine into some, uh, well, pardon the pun, into some big buckets, uh, and that's where I'm going to start. <laughs> so there, there's um, a number of questions revolve around, and, and I, I know we touched on some of these points, but they revolve around how do, how do we know how to bucket rates? Uh, where do we start? Uh, it seems complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so questions along those lines. And, and Jacob, I'll, I'll hand things over to you, but let me, I want to jump in at the beginning and say that it can be complicated. It, it, and it can look complicated, especially when we're talking about it up here on screen. But it's the type of exercise where one puts the work in up front to build a system that simplifies things down the line and simplifies things, especially for end users in the system. Um, but uh, what, what else What else would you say to that point, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's going to be really, it's going to be needs based and and not to keep, you know, beating this drum, um, but, but it's really important that whatever bucketing system you apply, it, it's good to understand that it probably and really most likely won't be uh, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, you're going to need to uh, you're going to need to account for um, preferences at the country level. But even if you're looking at kind of your whole operation, um, it's it's going to give you some indications of, of of what you're looking for in a in a bucketing system. And so, uh, fully acknowledging that you know, in, in some cases, the examples that, that that I shared might have oversimplified. Uh, some things and in you know depending on your compliance culture you might not be comfortable with a uh, with a bucketed rate that is anything more than 20 or 30 dollars an hour outside of what a title within that bucket should theoretically be earning um, and so it's it's absolutely you know when we do this kind of work with our clients it's very much a dialogue it's an iterative process and, and to echo what Eric said it is a Absolutely, uh, a, a, a bit of work up front, but we really we do that because we've seen a lot of positive effects for for end users down the road where they don't feel like they're getting a massive pile of data dumped on them that they then have to navigate through. So it certainly is a trade-off, uh, but it's one that in our experience, of le at least, we've found that it's worth making. Uh, and Jacob, I'm I'm just going to jump to one more question because I'm being told we're almost out of time. I rambled on too long, and I want to give people a chance to get to the next their next meetings, but also fill out that evaluation. So here's a here's a real nuts and bolts question for you: um, When you're setting premiums for an ad board chair, 
if or you're setting an, an additional uh, surcharge. How do you determine what's an appropriate premium or role adjustment if, if just going with a 10 to 20 percent increase isn't enough? So how do we see yeah. organizations setting those rates? Yeah, so it's it's interesting because you know when when the math when you see the math laid out side by side, taking these two different approaches, it doesn't always yield in that significant of a difference in the final compensation amount. It's really more about and, and this is almost semantics, but I feel like all of us in compliance, you know, that's kind of uh, that's it's a lot of what we do, and it's it's really acknowledging that an advisory board chair isn't necessarily putting in more effort on an hourly basis. And so it's better to reflect that by effectively giving them a premium that is something like maybe one or two additional hours of work. And so it's not unusual for me to see a rate card come through where the advisory board chair premium for a full day advisory board is somewhere around five or six hundred dollars, which comes out to around an hour and a half or two hours of their base hourly rate. Um, and so, you know, if, if you think about it, you know, uh, a 10 to 20 percent increase on an hourly rate, the math might work out to a similar end conclusion. But it's important for us to differentiate, you know, why are we compensating this individual more? And it's not really because they do more each hour than a general participant. It's because they are bringing something unique to the table, a set of expertise or, uh, or a, a moderator mindset that is particularly useful and specific to the goals of this engagement. That is the justification for the extra compensation, not necessarily the additional work that they put in each hour. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We're going to sign off. Uh, please take a look at that evaluation, and we will follow up with everyone whose questions we did not get to in the live session today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.